very, very short, um, quick bullseye. Last time. Last time. Last time. The ellipses. All right. Here's that, the bullseye. And we had this other bullseye at the beginning of the semester, you know, that had regular sets in the middle and context-free languages outside of that, and decidable languages outside of that, and then undecidable, and then not partially decidable. And it's like they're two separate diagrams. I never drew them on the board at the same time, you know, for fear that they would insult each other or something. But, but the truth is, I mean, they have to fit in with one another. So where do they fit in? Where do regular sets fit in in this diagram? Where do context-free languages fit in in this diagram? Where, do, uh, where does the decidable languages fit in this diagram? So let's start with the easiest question. If I drew a circle to represent decidable languages, where would it be? Around the whole thing, inside P, in P space, where would it be? Every one of these classes represents Turing machines that solve problems in this amount of time. So they all are guaranteed to halt in these time or space bounds. So decidable languages go out here. All this complexity theory stuff is underneath the decidable languages. Now, what about languages that are, that are context-free? Sets of strings that could be generated not by a Turing machine, but could also be generated by a context-free grammar. Everyone understand? It's hard to decide that, but, but let's say somebody gives you a grammar and says, here's a a grammar, and, and you know that the set of strings is from that grammar. How much time would it take for you to write a Turing machine, or how much time would the Turing machine take, once you wrote it, to, to accept all the strings in that set? That's the same question as, how much time does it take to solve the membership problem for context-free grammars? You're given a string, it comes from a context-free grammar, you're going to write a program now to decide it, not a push-down machine, a program. How much time does it take? <coughs> right, the best time we know is linear, for deterministic context-free languages at least. For non-deterministic, we have this algorithm we did in class, which is the order n cubed in the worst case. So all those context-free languages are way inside here, CFLs. And in particular, they're n cubed or less. Okay, so they're way inside. Now what about regular sets? They're even further inside. How long would it take your program to recognize strings that were regular sets? More or less linear time. It just scans the input going from state to state, and it knows the answer. <coughs> okay, so the book actually mentions a nice result about that. The book talks about Turing machines that try to accept this, right? And it gives you one method that takes order n squared. Just a completely random method takes order n squared. You need, you, you find the matches, you go to the next match, you might scan the whole thing n times. That gets order n squared. And the book tells you a more clever way to do it. They figure out a way to do it in n log n. You can think about that yourselves, how you might want to do this on a Turing machine in n log n, so that you don't actually scan all of it n times, you scan all of it at most log n times. It's not too tough to think about it. You can figure it out. Look it up in the book if you can't figure it out. Then the book mentions, and it's kind of a neat theorem, he doesn't prove it, he says, and I don't ever expect to do any better than this. And I don't ever expect to do any better than this because this is not a regular set. And it's known that you can't do better than n log n for things that aren't regular sets. Regular sets can be done in linear time. Okay, but you shouldn't expect to do, to do better in general. Right, and he talks a little about that. But generally speaking, all I want you to know is that regular sets are in here, context-free languages, polynomial time, etc. cetera, decidables out there. So complexity theory is a long discussion about what happens in between here and here, and then spreading those classes out. It's like a big magnifying glass. Just a little hole I wanted to mention. I want to make sure you all knew this. And um, I don't think there's any other things that, that we really missed out. We didn't spend a lot of time talking about particular reductions because we did spend a lot of time talking about that in algorithms. And I didn't want to just redo it again because they can get very, very complex and sometimes tedious. But I did give you problems on it because I think they're fundamental to this topic. So you should work on them. If you can't get them, ask me. I'll help you get them. And, um, 
and that will end problem set 5. I also decided tomorrow we, uh, we have the final exam for this month and I want everybody to finish by 3 and then go away and have a good time over the weekend. Uh, you can hand in problem set 5 when you come back on Tuesday if you like. That's okay. But I want the exam to be in my hands so I can grade it over the weekend. So in order to do that in the way that will make it best, none of you are going to concentrate if I do a lecture tomorrow morning anyway. So I'm just not going to do one. Uh, you can come in 9.30, start the exam then, but be done by 3. You can also come in 1 o'clock and be done by 3. Okay? It's, it's meant same time as last. Same duration. Okay. Questions? All right, so now I'm ready to shift over. <coughs> Sometimes called the recursion theorem. Sometimes in more mathematical books, it's called a fixed point theorem. Now, of all the things we've done this whole semester, every single one, whether you like this stuff or not, does have completely practical applications in computer science, both theoretical and and uh, and real life. This is just more of a curiosity. You can find a gazillion web pages that talk about it because it's a really cool curiosity. But the main curiosity that this implies is that programs are powerful enough to be written so that they can, as part of what they do, write descriptions of themselves out into memory. They can do more than that, but part of what they can do is actually know about themselves, know their own description. That's basically what this says. I will tell you specifically what it says in a little while, but I want to give you some intuition about it. The reason I'm giving you intuition, I found this great quote, which I thought about a long time before I decided whether I was going to do this lecture or not. I thought maybe I'd just do something else that would be easier to understand and more fun. And then I found this quote, and it really made me think that. This is by Juris Hartmanis, who's at Cornell, who's uh, one of the pioneers of complexity <laughs> theory. Worked on it from the 60s up through, he's probably even active today, in, um, in research. He says, the recursion theorem is like tennis. Unless you become exposed to it at age five, you will never become world class. <laughs> so I thought about this and I'm thinking, well, I'll just teach it to them in 45 minutes. That'll be no problem. <laughs> and then I thought, I thought, is he right or not? And I, actually, you know, I think he's, he's right to, in some sense that, that this is not something you see once and say, okay, now I get it. It's something you see once and then it has to kind of seep in. And you get it better and better and better every year of your life. And if you started seeing it at five, you know, it's like these little kids who can play with, with a mouse very early. It's like part of their hand. They get muscle memory. This is kind of like, I don't know what kind of memory it is. But then, then I was passing by Greg in the, in the hall, and he goes, yeah, but how many people really want to become world-class experts on recursion theory? And I said, well, that's true. Probably none of you do. So I figure you're not going to become world-class experts if you see it when you're 30. But you'll certainly get enough of a sense after today of what this is really about and what it implies. Because we're going to start with this very abstract description about Turing machines, but then we're actually going to go and take the implication of that abstraction, which is that, one of which is that programs can actually output themselves. You run the program and the output is the program. Uh, you've all told me that you read a paper about this in systems. So the programs that do this in some languages are longer than others, depending on what the language lets you do. But I looked at dozens of these. There's a page, a web page, that has these self-producing uh, programs or printing programs, self-printing programs in hundreds of languages. And the one that I thought was most clear but still captures the, the flavor of it all and pretty much follows the abstract discussion in Turing machines is one that's written in, uh, in a language that I know well called Logo, which is like a dialect of scheme. So I brought my little logo interpreter on my laptop here today. We're going to write this program on the board in logo, taking the abstract Turing machine explanation as our motivation, <laughs> using that to help us write the program. Then we'll actually look at it and see what it does. I also pulled out a C version for those of you who are a little more traditional. And it's very similar to the logo one, but a little more obscure. So I didn't like it as much. But I'll show you how that works, too. All right, so we'll do that later, but now we first need to talk about what's really going on. I should mention that this, this peculiarity of a program that actually 